In this video, we're going to take a look at the fourth GraphQL lab on Portswigger's Web Security Academy. The lab is called Bypassing GraphQL Brute Force Protections. Before we started the GraphQL playlist, we made an introductory video which went through the background information on what GraphQL is and how to work with it in Burp Suite. So if you missed that, I would encourage you to go back and check it out. Otherwise, let's check out the background information that's specific to today's lab. Ordinarily, GraphQL objects can't contain multiple properties with the same name. Aliases enable you to bypass this restriction by explicitly naming the properties you want the API to return. You can use aliases to return multiple instances of the same type of object in one request. While aliases are intended to limit the number of API calls you need to make, they can also be used to brute force a GraphQL endpoint. Many endpoints will have some sort of rate limiter in place to prevent brute force attacks, but some rate limiters work on the number of HTTP requests received rather than the number of operations performed. Because aliases effectively enable you to send multiple queries in a single HTTP message, they can bypass this restriction. The simplified example below shows a series of alias queries checking whether the store discount codes are valid. This operation could potentially bypass rate limiting as it's in a single HTTP request, even though it could be potentially used to check a vast number of discount codes at once. So the example demonstrates this. We've got an is valid discount query, but we can see that inside there, it's actually querying three different codes to see whether they're valid. So with the background information out of the way, let's take a look at the lab. The description says, the user login mechanism for this lab is powered by a GraphQL API. The API endpoint has a rate limiter that returns an error if it receives too many requests from the same origin in a short space of time. To solve the lab, brute force the login mechanism to sign in as Carlos. Use the list of authentication lab passwords as your password source. Okay, so let's open the lab. So you know that I like to explore the site functionality, even though it's generally quite similar. So we can try and log in, even though we weren't given credentials this time, we could try and update the email as well. We could go and view the blog posts, or we could go and look for the common GraphQL endpoints. The reason we're doing all this is so that we can go to our Burp suite, have a look at the HTTP history, and then we'll be able to see what the endpoint is, hopefully, but also the query that is sent there. While that's good practice to do, we know specifically this time that we need to brute force a login for Carlos. So let's focus on that login form. And I just want to see how it reacts. Then if we try and do Wiener with an invalid password, it says invalid, it says invalid again, it says invalid again. But on the fourth attempt, it says we've made too many incorrect login attempts and we need to wait one minute. So we're allowed to make three attempts and then we have to wait a minute. And that one minute might increment. So it might be that if we do three more attempts in a minute, it'll say, please wait two minutes before we do three more. I'm not too sure about that, but it's possible. And we obviously want to find a better way of doing this. One thing I want to know as well, let me just try that again. So it's still saying we can't log in. What if I change the username now? Okay, we still can't do it with Carlos either. So it's not based on the username, which means we can't even enumerate usernames. If we knew that it was username based, what we could do is say, try three passwords for Carlos then try three passwords for the next user, then try three for the next user. And then we do that until we get through all the users. And then we'll start with Carlos again with the next three passwords. But it looks like this is based by IP address or some other criteria. Anyway, while we're waiting for that to unlock, let me send one of these requests through to our repeater. And I'm going to go to the GraphQL tab, right click, set the introspection query. And then we'll send that off and see, do we get everything back? We do, we get like 2000 lines, one and a half thousand lines. So we probably want to go and visualize this. I'm over on the GraphQL visualizer at the moment, and I'm going to paste in the result that we just got. And I'm going to scroll up to the top and remove our HTTP headers. And then we'll be able to see what the schema looks like. So we can make these two different queries, get blog posts or get all blog posts. And they have these values. None of this is any use to us because we're focusing on the login. So let me just close this down. Let's go back and right click the response that we got in Burp and we'll save it to the sitemap. And now that means we can go over here and we can just very easily have a look at what the different queries are. We can see some mutations here and here's a login one. So let's send that to the repeater. So let's remind ourselves of the example that we saw. It had this is valid discount. But then for each of these checks, they add a number, and then there needs to be a different code, which is specified. So 
that's going to be a slight problem for us in the sense that we want to loop through all of the different passwords, but we need to populate this. So we want this to have in the username and then say 100 different passwords or 200 different passwords. And I don't want to do that manually. That's a very slow process. So ideally, you would write a script to do that for you. However, I took the easy slash lazy approach and checked the tip here, which basically says the same thing that you need to craft out the statement, the query, and you either need to script that or do it all manually, which is very slow. So they actually provided this with the password list that they gave earlier. They provided this JavaScript. So we can actually just open up our console. And if we paste this in, this will copy this to the clipboard. And I'll just paste this in here so you can see what it looks like. And there we go. We've got 100 different attempts. Each one has the same username, but a different password. And then this token and success parameter that were required as well. So we basically want to go and paste this in here. There's a couple of things we need to do. First of all, we'll take this part out, the parameters, and I think we keep the login name there. Let's just leave it at that. I'll paste all of these in, just directly copied and pasted from the console. And we also need to remove this, I believe. Let me click send first of all. So these are all saying false. Let me see. Oh, I want to search for true, not success. Oh, okay. So this one did come back with true. And I guess we'll test it out. So it was number 24. Let me search here as well. Oh, I can't search this one. Okay, let me scroll down then. 24, the password was 654321. Let's try it, although we might be locked out after that. No, we only made one request, so why would it be locked out? So there we go, we've solved the lab. Today, we've looked at bypassing GraphQL brute force protections, and next time, we'll look at the final GraphQL lab, which is performing CSRF exploits over GraphQL. Don't forget that if you master these GraphQL hacking techniques, you might as well see if you can get some money for it in the process. And for that, I would encourage you to sign up to the Integrity platform. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down below. Thanks.